Good morning, and welcome to all who join us at Acton Congregational Church, whether you're gathered here in person or are worshiping virtually in, in your own home. No matter who you are, whom you love, or where you are in your spiritual journey, we're, we're so glad that you're here with us this morning as we seek to live God's love. My name is uh, Rick Barnes. <laughs> And I am the welcoming deacon this morning. Uh, some announcements. Uh, we will have a baptism immediately after the morning service. Out of an abundance of caution and care for those who will be part of the celebration, we will hold the service only for the family. But it will be live streamed so the whole church can witness to the commitment the parents are making to raise their child in the faith of the church. Please avoid congregating in the narthex after the service. That means skedaddle. Okay. The thrift shop will open for business on October 4th. Uh, our mission of the week, Neighbors in Need, is a special mission offering of the United Church of Christ that supports ministries of justice and compassion in the United States. This offering will be taken on October 3rd next week. Details on all of these are given under church news in the last page of the bulletin. If you'd like to receive a confidential prayers following the service, the prayer team will be available via Zoom immediately after worship to pray in confidence with you and for you. The link is in this morning's e-news. And now, as we enter into the sacred time of worship, I invite you to open your hearts and minds to God. Good morning. Let our voices join together as we say today's prayer of the day. Holy and loving God, we come together in search of a still place where we can safely open our hearts to you. Slip your peace quietly into our souls in this time of worship. Make us glad to be with one another and inspire us to share, without hesitation or apologies, the joy of your saving grace. Unhinge our minds from our worries and doubts that we may praise you with our whole selves. Awaken in us a deep gratitude for the breath of life and for all creation. Forgive us, we pray when we lose faith in our ability to make our planet a better home for our children and all humanity. Too often, the problems of our world overwhelm us, and we feel powerless to do what is needed to fix them. We confess 
that we have risked too little to protect the miracle of life on earth. Have mercy on us, O God. Release us from our anxiety about the future and grant us grace to live with hope. Jesus once said, let the little children come to me. Here we are, God, yours, that we may receive the blessings of love, forgiveness, and courage to change ourselves and our world. Amen. And now I would, like, I would like to invite the confirmation class to come forward and stand over here in the corner in a little socially distanced clump. Come on down. It's good to see so many of you here this morning. Friends of ACC, this is this year's confirmation class. These are our seventh and eighth graders. Come on in, come on in. These are our seventh and eighth graders. Last year, for a variety of reasons, we adjusted our confirmation program so that it's now a two-year program. So seventh graders and eighth graders are both in confirmation. And these two years are different. Last year, we had a uh, classroom year, as we call it, where if you were in eighth grade last year, we learned all about God, Jesus, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, the church, all the sorts of things that you need to learn in confirmation class. But for obvious reasons, we weren't able to do a lot of things that you want to do in a confirmation class. We couldn't go out and serve. We couldn't meet and interact with people of different faiths. We couldn't uh, spend time together on trips or activities. Well, this year is our discipleship year. And so all of us will be going to do all of that kind of discipleship out in the world this year. Starting next week, when we go to visit Worcester Fellowship, which is a group that ministers to the unhoused population in Worcester, we'll worship with them, we'll bring donations of socks and Dunkin' Donuts gift cards. A couple weeks after that, we'll participate in the Concord Crop Walk for Hunger. And then for the rest of the year, we'll go visit synagogues and the Islamic Center in Boston. We'll go visit the, an interfaith youth group called Kids for Peace. We will have overnights, we will have retreats, and of course we'll have lots of fun and games and probably ice cream sandwiches. And so I wanted to introduce you all to this special group of confirmands, and I'd like to invite all of us to offer them a blessing on their journey for this year. So please, pray with me. Oh God, may you bless this confirmation class Bless these seventh graders as they begin their confirmation journey, and bless these eighth graders as they continue their confirmation journey. May they know that they do not walk alone. May they know that your spirit is with them always, guiding them, strengthening them, carrying them. May they know that they are surrounded by this community of believers, and may we, the church, support them and listen to them, affirming their voices and recognizing that their voice is the voice of the church of the future and the present. As you open the hearts of our confirmation class on their confirmation journey, open the hearts of the church as well, so that we might not just welcome them into the church we know, but walk with them on the journey to become the church we are called to be, following in the footsteps of our brother Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. <laughs> Thanks. And I'd like to invite Beth Liss forward for a stewardship moment. Good morning. This is my first time back and it's nice to see so many faces uh, rather than being online. Um, 
I'm here this morning to introduce on behalf of the Stewardship Committee uh, our theme for uh, the stewardship this season. And that theme is connecting, communing, and celebrating. Um, we came upon this theme because we feel it reflects on the many ways we as a church come together even as we chart our way through this unprecedented pandemic. When we talk of the three C's and connecting, communing, and celebrating, we think about connecting with one another in person and in virtually, communing with God and with each other, and celebrating the gift of our church in our lives. When I think about it for me personally, um, thinking on connecting, I think about our church has very strong connections. Um, mine, lots of times I see them everywhere. I'm out walking my dog and I see my neighbors. Um, I'm out in town and I see a friend from the church. There's a real connection, I think, throughout the community. And sometimes it's as simple as that, or sometimes it's somebody reaching out and helping you when you're in need. Um, again, I think of a neighbor who many years ago helped us out by letting us stay in their house when we needed electricity and didn't have any. So there's a real connection there. As far as communing with God, uh, for me, a lot of it is sitting in here in the peaceful time to get away from the stresses of life. And it can be here. And then I also find it a lot when I'm out just walking, which I'm sure we've all done a lot over the past year and a half, out walking around in the woods and sort of seeing God's presence everywhere. Um, one of these days, I think I'm going to try to go join that walk in wonder group just because I feel like I probably have a connection there. And then finally, just celebrating the gift of, of our church in our lives. Um, we need to remember that we still have this great gift of the church even as we're apart. Um, we have the support from people, we have the peace, and we have the friendship and the rem remembrance that God's love is all around us. So. Finally, I just wanted to uh, tell everyone that Stewardship Sunday is going to be October 31st this year. I know there are other activities that go on this day, but um, I think stewardship is going to come first. Um, we are going to be collecting here within the service, but then we're also trying to work out other ways, and there'll be more details on that um, in the coming weeks. But thank you, and... Uh, God be with you.
Our lesson today is from Psalm 8, verses 1 to 9. Listen for the word of God. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you have founded a bulwark because of your foes to silence the enemy and the avenger. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Yet you have made them a little lower than God and crowned them with glory and honor. You have given them dominion over the works of your hands. You have put all things under their feet, all sheep and oxen, and also the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, and the fish of the sea, whatever passes along the paths of the seas. O Lord, our sovereign, how majestic is your name in, the, all, the, in all the earth. May God add God's blessing to the reading of God's word, and to God's name be power and glory. Amen. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, chapter 10, verses 13 through 16. Listen for God's word to the church. People were bringing little children to him, Jesus, in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will, will, will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we give thanks for the sacred time of meditation. Give us a spiritual curiosity that can make room in our hearts and minds for your creative word. Speak to us this morning, O God, and inspire your people gathered in person and virtually to use our brains, our hands, our voices, our faith, and our love to mend and heal our broken world. In the name of our cross, dead, but risen Christ, we pray. Amen. That is one question that has been on the mind of parents, educators, and social scientists alike since the onset of the pandemic. Will the kids be all right? If you do a Google search, the results for this question generate a copious supply of blogs, new sites, and scholarly articles that detail not only parents' ongoing concern for the well-being of their children, but that also provides a host of metrics researchers are compiling to assess the impact of the last 18 months on kids. So far, scientific data shows us that young children, thanks to their still developing immune system and, and naive cells that fight off the coronavirus more readily, are much less likely to develop 
severe COVID-19 illness, illnesses than adults. Although new variants of the virus do pose a greater threat to kids, especially to school-aged children who cannot be vaccinated yet, children, advocate groups, and researchers in the, field, in the field of social sciences have been noticing something with great alarm, that the choices adults make to handle the pandemic continue to affect young people negatively and may have lasting consequences for them long after COVID has become a more manageable, hopefully seasonal infection. The editorial board of the New York Times said in an opinion essay published last month, what many of us are reluctant to voice out loud, that the kids are not all right. Children are by nature extremely resilient. They can and often do live through tough times. They experience losses. Kids do get severely and seriously ill. They go through the ups and downs of life, including pandemics. But if they have a caring and supportive environment around them, children become, uh, bounce back and grow up to live full, healthy, and productive lives. But the pandemic has revealed that parents, politicians, religious leaders, and society as a whole have allowed our kids and their future to get entangled in our culture wars, in our conflicts over individual rights, in our struggles to define reality in America, in the divide we've created between progressives and conservatives, and in our inability to face a critical health, public health issue like the COVID-19 pandemic together as adults. For 18 months, we have been fighting over face mask mandates, and even now, with the highly contagious Delta variant putting more school-age kids in ICUs, politicians in several states are voting for bills that bar schools from requiring students and teachers to wear face coverings. The vaccines, which are safe and effective against severe COVID and hospitalizations, have become as divisive of an issue as abortion or gay rights or the 2020 presidential election. The editorial board of the New York Times accused our elected officials of being more concerned about reopening bars and restaurants than safely reopening schools that hold the future of more than 50 million American children in their hands. Our childish handling of the pandemic has become the major stressor in our children's lives. They have been the ones without power or a say who have had to face remote learning, isolation from their peers, school closures, outbreaks of the virus in their classrooms and communities, the possibility of getting sick in districts where vac vaccination is low, more school closures, in home stress, gaps in their academic progress, and an uncertain future. Our adult culture is addicted to the junk food of toxic hyperpartisanship that sickens our society with acute divisions. And our addiction is having an impact on our children's physical and mental health. Clinical psychologists noted that this generation, which they call Generation COVID, and their older peers have seen their childhood and youth redefined. And many school-age kids are experiencing higher levels of stress, depression, and more anxiety. I think we all know it, but it's worth saying it again out loud. We could have fared so much better if early on, instead of giving in to our childish tendencies and overreacting to the pandemic and to our national politics, we had kept our focus on how to implement the mitigating strategies to contain the virus without letting our own anxious and uncompromising ideologies take over our kids' lives. The unforgettable American cartoonist 
Charles Schulz put in the mouth of Snoopy one of the best tips I have ever come across on how to face our adult childish inclinations. In the classic Peanuts comic strip, Snoopy appears perched on top of his doghouse early in the morning thinking, sometimes when I get up in the morning, I feel very peculiar. I feel like I've just got to bite a cat. I feel like if I don't bite a cat before sundown, I'll go crazy. But then I just take a deep breath and forget about it. That's what is known as real maturity. Real maturity is what our kids are asking us to show, practice, and develop because they understand perhaps better than you and I do that they will not be all right. Their future will not be okay. Human civilization will not do well and our planet will not support human life as we know it if the adults in their lives do not take a very deep breath Forget about our peculiar impulse to keep living as we have always lived and begin to pay more attention to their voices, their concerns, their worries, their hopes, and, and the dreams of our young people. A recent landmark survey revealed the unset that the unsettling disruptions of the pandemic are not the only global issue weighing heavily on the hearts and minds of our children especially of our youth. Climate change is also causing psychological and emotional distress in kids around the world. Carolina Hickman, who specializes in climate psychology at the University of Bath in the UK, even has a non-clinical diagnosis for the kind of negative feelings children experience when they talk about climate change. She calls it climate anxiety. Anger, fear, anxiety, sadness, helplessness, and powerlessness are the most common emotions shared by all the 10,000 kids who were surveyed in 10 different countries on the topic of global warming. Eight out of 10 young participants told the researchers that adults, including their own parents, have failed to do what is needed to preserve life on Earth. Half voiced a lack of hope for human civilization. Four out of 10 said that they do not plan to have children because they fear more frequent extreme weather, natural disasters, food scarcity, water shortages, and loss of biodiversity will make parts of the globe uninhabitable. Two thirds believe that governments are not taking climate change seriously enough to slow down the destructive effects of human activities on the planet. Most alarming and disquieting, all 10,000 kids around the world feel betrayed by us. Feel betrayed by us, the adults in their lives. They feel othered by us. They, they said that the most adults in their lives make them feel as if their fears, worries, and anxieties are not real or justifiable. They are afraid that their future may not be all right because we are just pretending to be listening while in truth, adults are still conforming to the predominant narrative of the power brokers of the world who want all of us to believe that we are doing already everything possible and realistic in, that is realistically doable to protect the environment. Jesus said to his disciples, let the little children come to me, do not stop them. Churches love to hear these words. We love to imagine Jesus opening his arms wide open to welcome and bless bundles of cuteness and adorableness. We like to think of ourselves not as the disciples who wanted to keep the kids out of Jesus' way, but as Jesus himself, so we tell each other that children and youth programs are our congregation's priority because kids are the future of the church. 
Every church that interviewed me before I came to ACC asked if I had innovative and creative strategies to attract family with children to the church. Our own church has not hesitated to put our money where our mouth is to show how much we care for our children and youth. We hired Charlotte as our part-time director of family ministries to infuse our Sunday school program with new energy. We called Andrew to nurture the faith of the kids in confirmation class and our youth group. No one can question that we welcome children with open arms and open hearts. It doesn't matter if we hardly see the youth in our morning services or if the kids in pre-pandemic days were quickly ushered away from the sanctuary to go to Sunday school because, let's be honest, little children do get fidgety and they make distracting noises and they do not always appreciate the structure and length of our services. So yes, they get restless. We know that. Sometimes even adults get restless. The Gospel of Mark says that Jesus was indignant when he realized that his own followers, the same disciples who saw him place a child in their midst and say, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and the one who sent me. Those same people were turning kids away. In the original Greek, The verb the evangelist used to describe the disciples' action is the same that appears in occasions when Jesus is rebuking or silencing evil forces and powers. It is as if the disciples assumed that children would take Jesus' mind off the serious business of proclaiming the kingdom of God and not in a good way. They thought that what Jesus meant by welcoming children was to keep them around, but at arm's length, silent and almost invisible. Jesus is extremely displeased with his friends' childish behavior, and he makes a point to give them a visual lesson on what God's kingdom looks like. He embraces the children, his followers, thought to be nothing more than bothersome nuisance. Jesus makes space for young people in his life and in his community. Once again, he reminds his disciples that he was willing to stoop down to pick up a child because their vulnerability, their openness to receive God's blessings, their innate curiosity, their unfiltered love for life, and their natural idealism help the faith community understand what is needed to live in the kingdom of God. Jesus tells his disciples to let the little children come to him because they are not yet cynical about humanity or skeptical about faith. They still have hope. They still believe. They still want to do what is good and right. They are not yet satisfied with the world as it is, but can still imagine a different world for humanity. And it wasn't enough for Jesus to welcome the children. He was looking for a more meaningful relationship with these human beings that were completely dependent on their parents and their community of faith to feel loved, accepted, valued, and empowered. In a beautiful moment of tenderness, Jesus takes the children into his arms and blesses them. He refuses to look at the kids around him in the same way his disciples had judged them. He does not see any of those children as insignificant or powerless. Jesus believes in their potential and appreciates their childlike wonder is still unspoiled by our adult childishness. I was talking to a clergy friend of mine about the absence of children and young adults in our pews, and he made an intriguing observation. He said that mainline Christians for the last 50 years have been gradually making young people's presence less noticeable in the church. While they are little kids, we offer children's sermons every Sunday to carve out a brief space in our midst for them. And then we send them away to Sunday school. In confirmation class, 
Kids are expected to show up in the services occasionally to fulfill the requirements for membership. Then they join the youth group and we only see them when that is a fundraiser for mission trips or on Youth Sunday. We do not get to know the young people in our churches unless we are directly involved with youth ministry and we seldom worship with them side by side. And if young people do come to worship, we welcome them with wide open arms as long as they like the music we love, enjoy the hymns we sing, and do not try to change any of our cherished traditions or question our theologies. My friend believes that we lack the conviction that Jesus had about kids, that they are an integral and vital part of the church's present. And if that's true, if we really believe that our children's and youth's voices matter and they do have a place in our church, we have to be real mature about it. We have to forget about our own strongly held adult opinions for a bit and be more intentional about creating a welcoming space where our kids feel safe to tell us their stories and what's in their hearts. Kids will not hang around the church if we do not take seriously their anxiety about the future. They will not come back to worship if they suspect that our faith has nothing to say about re reality, the reality of climate change or the pandemic. If we care about our young people, then we have to appreciate their idealism and passion for a world that may be very different from the one we created for them. Young adults will stop coming to church as soon as they can if we do not show them that we want to understand, understand their concerns, their fears, and their hopes, and we are, and we are willing to seek out tangible ways to support them emotionally and spiritually. Like Jesus, we too have to be willing to bless our children and the best way we can do it today is by showing them that Christianity, the church, is not indifferent to their concern for the natural world, which we know is God's gift to all of us. As the psalmist says so eloquently, O oh Lord, when I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals? that you care for them. Friends, God does care about us. God does care for our children. God does care about the future of this planet. As a th one theologian said so beautifully, the earth is the fruit of God's womb. Young adults are right to question the way we have used our knowledge and technology to tame, dominate, and exploit nature rather than find ways to relate to the environment in a way that is life-sustaining. Even our traditional theologies have taken this idea that we are above the natural world too far and have justified our destructive and exploitative relationship with the work of God's fingers. Our kids' voices are calling us to accept our God-given responsibility and privilege to care for the earth. Rather than gradually letting the kids vanish from our pews, we need to invite and welcome them to join us so we do not stay stuck in our own childish divisions, ideologies, and theologies. We have to practice real maturity and dare to let young people challenge us to live with a childlike hope for the possibility that the adults and governments of the world will also see that the time is now to put the well-being of our children and our planet ahead of our peculiar impulses to keep doing what causes the virus to spread and the climate to change. We cannot deny the bad news about how the pandemic and climate change have affected our children negatively. We cannot dismiss climate anxiety as some kind of symptom of the emotional fragility of a younger generation. Young people all over the world are deeply distressed about what the future may look like for them, and they are rightly blaming us for our inertia 
and complacency. The good news is that Jesus showed us what to do. Let the children, the youth, the young adults come. Let their voices inspire us to take action. Rather than turning them away, let's blast their idealism and show real maturity by not leaving them alone in their anger, fear, anxiety, confusion, and sense of powerlessness. Let's be the church that, like Christ, sees the potential in our kids and that will take seriously our responsibility to ensure that the world's children will be all right. People were bringing children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. And the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw what was happening, he was indignant. And he said to his followers, to the church, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to those who are childlike belongs the kingdom of God. And let the whole church say, Amen. Amen. Let our hearts be united in the spirit of prayer. Loving parent God, heavenly Father, mother of us all, help us this day to receive your kingdom like a little child. Slack-jawed with wonder at the glory of your creation, prone to fits of exuberant and unabashed joy open to daily growth and transformation, blessed with uninhibited imaginations to dream of what could be, inspired by a never-ending stream of curiosity that leads us closer to your loving heart. May we see your splendor shining forth in all the little things, insects, puddles, hugs, smiles, songs, 
games. Let us not grow jaded. Let us not be distracted by daily worries and stresses. Let us not lose sight of your divine spark of creation, which is so obvious and apparent to children, and yet lost on so many grown-ups. Renew our hearts, O God. Bless us with energetic spirits, ready to embrace all of creation in a spirit of play and friendship. Help us to trust that when we are afraid, which happens no matter how old we are, that you are there for us, to comfort us and hold us. And when we get overwhelmed, you are there to strengthen us and support us. And when we are sad, you will lift us up and sing us songs and remind us that we are blessed and beloved. God, sing your songs of love into our hearts this day as we lift the following members and friends of our congregation to you in prayer. God, this morning we pray for Dave following the loss of his father, Douglas. We pray for Audrey's daughter, Dory. We pray for John. We pray for the family of April. We pray for Merrill, following the loss of her dad, Donald. We pray for Helen, for Griff, for Jim, for Ibbett, for Zachary. And we continue to pray for all of those who are sick with COVID-19, for all of those who have lost loved ones, for all of those who are fighting it still on the front lines. God, hear all of these prayers along with these silent meditations of our own hearts. God, we lift these prayers to you as we say together the words that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, I'm sure you have heard that stewardship joke when the pastor stands up in front of the congregation and says, well, I have bad news and I have good news. Uh, the bad news is that the church needs money and the good news is that you have money in your wallet. Uh, well, uh, we are here to invite you to support the ministries of this church. Uh, we are definitely trying to be a church, seeking to be a church where young people, children, youth, do have a voice where they feel safe and free to express their doubts, question uh, their faith, worship God, and journey with us as we uh, seek to live God's love in the world. So your support is very meaningful, and I invite you to give with gratitude um, to, this, to, to this church so we can do the work of God here in Acton. Your morning offering will now be received.
Join me in prayer. Creator of life, grant that our gifts may be used to carry your love and grace, your truth and peace, your healing and saving presence to all we are called to serve, especially to the young people and children around us. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Friends, go back into the world and open your hearts and your minds to the young people around us. Listen to their voices. And young people around us, push us, question us, help us to stay closer to the reality of God's kingdom. Share with us your idealism. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.
So let's see. Okay. Can I can I ask you a favor? Sure. Uh, at the end, after the baptism, would you hand the, the gifts to the family? Sure. Okay. And so that would go to the, the mom. The mom. Yeah. yeah. So it's a company. Yeah. So be careful because we don't have it. So oh. hopefully it's not against the rules.
um, moment of baptism. So friends, following the example of Jesus who welcomed and blessed the little children who came to him, this morning we gather to welcome Sophia Adair into the great story of faith that stretches back to the very moment creation came into being. As Christians, we use symbols and rituals to help us understand the wideness and depth of God's love. In our Holy Scriptures, the Spirit of God labors over the water to give birth to the earth. Out of the waters of creation, the Creator soaked the earth in love, drenched creation in beauty, saturated our planet with life, and created humankind out of the richness of the wet humus of the ground. <laughs> this is good. These ancient stories of our faith remind us that water is a blessing to life. Water sustains life. Without the Creator's gifts of water, humanity would not exist. Today we gather with Lindsay and John to get Sophia wet with this gift of life-giving and life-sustaining water. In this sacred ritual, we are invited to see Sophia's life as a precious gift from God to her family and to humankind. Around this baptismal font, we declare our faith that Sophia is a beloved child of God, and we baptize her hoping that she will grow up knowing the grace, compassion, and love of God, which we believe were revealed in Jesus Christ. To his disciples, Jesus, the Son of God, said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of age. We give thanks for the faith and love that brings us together, and in faithful obedience to Christ's command, we baptize Sophia Adair and receive her into the eternal covenant of forgiving grace. And we like participation, so don't be worried. Yes, it's okay. Participation is good. Lindsay and John, recognizing that Sophia is a gift from God to you and aware of your responsibility to nurture and raise her, do you desire to have Sophia baptized in the faith of the universal church, do you? Do you promise with God's help to strive to, so, to show Sophia the way of Christ and encourage her to be kind, love her neighbors, care for the environment, and understand Jesus as a guide to how God would have us live, do you? Do you promise with God's help to continue to provide a loving home for Sophia and to bring her up so far as you're able in the fellowship of the church, do you? And grandparents, do you promise to love and support Sophia in a manner that will always inspire faithfulness, kindness, joy, and spiritual growth in her heart, do you? And now, Courtney, you are it. So today you are standing here alongside John and Lindsay as a friend who is committed to being a loving and caring presence in Sophia's life. It will be easy. Look at her. Do you commit yourself to being her godparent by doing everything possible to ensure that Sophia will learn to trust God's goodness and live a full life of freedom, curiosity, love, and faith? Do you? And now our deacon has a few questions. Please show your commitment. 
We do. Let us pray over the water. Holy Spirit, you moved over the waters at the dawn of creation. Move over us today and bless this water as we baptize Sophia into Christ's family. May the touch of this water, an ancient symbol of life and God's love, draw Sophia into the fellowship of the church and keep her heart and mind always open to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, Sophia, it's you and me. Hey, hi. How are you? How are you? It's okay. James is being healthy, and Sophia, I'm going to put some water in your head, okay? Sophia, I baptize you in the name of the Father. and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. You want to put a little hand here? No? Okay. Sophia, you are a child of the covenant, sealed by the Holy Spirit, and marked as Christ's own forever. Let us pray. God, we give thanks for this beautiful baby, for Sophia there. We give you thanks for her health and for her parents and her family. We pray that she may be wise and grow in wisdom, like her name, that she may be open to your love and be a blessing to all humanity. For we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Look at that. And just right there, she's like, I'm going to go back. <laughs> Friends, may the peace of Christ be with you. And I put a lot of water in you, so but you look wonderful. <laughs> so, well, peace, the peace of Christ be with you. Oh, good. And thank you for being here, and you may go in peace. This is, and if you want to take some pictures, it's fine too. Uh, and she's awesome. Like all your kids, I mean, you know, James was like great. Remember James? You were like, have your, have your picture. It's one of my favorite pictures. He's like calling. He's calling someone, which is, yeah. Well, no, that's something like sometimes, you know, kids do that. Like, so, and, and adults do that during the worship service too. They, they play with their phones. No, no. It's great. Oh, who is this little baby here? Oh, my goodness. You're so small. It's so big, adorable. 